Sergeants, can we please start the recording? Computer recording rolling. Back recording is up. Backup is rolling. Okay. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Governmental Operations. At this time, we ask that all council members and staff please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions throughout the hearing, please place cell phones and electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you have testimony you wish to submit for the record, you may do so via email by sending it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. We thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we're ready to begin. Thank you so much. Good morning. I am Council Member Fernando Cabrera, Chair of the Committee on Governmental Operation. I want to start off by thanking the members of the committee who have joined us today. Council Member uh, and Majority Leader Combo, Council Member Yeager, Council Member Marcel, Council Member Lewis, Council Member Diaz, and Council Member uh, Ben Kalos. That's what I see so far. Today, we are hearing four pieces of legislation. The first relates to the statutory blackout period for government officials running for local office. Blackout period is a period of time before an election during which sitting government officials running for office are prohibited from sending out official mass mailings. Blackout periods prevent incumbents from using the power of the office to gain an electoral advantage. Currently, the state assembly members running for local offices are subject to a shorter blackout period than local officials running in the same election. Introduction 34, sponsored by Councilmember Lewis, would eliminate the discrepancy by reducing the blackout period for local officials to 30 days, the same time frame that applies to assembly members under the rules of the state assembly. The second bill. We're hearing today is an introduction, is introduction number 66, sponsored by Majority Leader Combo. This bill will make the mayor's office to prevent gun violence a charter mandated entity. First established by the mayors, by Mayor de Blasio in 2017, the office to prevent gun violence is responsible, responsible for coordinating the city, city's various anti-gun violence initiatives. The core component of this office is the crisis management system. This system which uses a cure violence approach to stop neighborhood violence at its source was based on a proposal from the city council's task force to combat gun violence as one of the co-chairs of that task force. I'm proud to be hearing a, a bill that will enshrine the office to prevent gun violence in our city's charter. The final two bills we are hearing today relate to how city agencies enforce city public health, safety, and environmental laws. Proposed introduction number 167A, sponsored by council member myself, will require certain agencies to equip their ins inspectors with devices capable of issuing warnings for first time violations. In addition, a pre considered introduction sponsored by myself will ensure that all city inspectors will uh, inspector issue citations using portable electronic devices similar to the ones already used by the Department of Sanitation and several other agencies. Together, these bills will ensure, will help ensure the fair and effective enforcement of our local health, safety, and environmental regulation. And with that, I want to thank Council Member Lewis, Majority Leader Combo, Council Member Marcel for their leadership on these bills. I also want to thank committee staff C.J. Murray and Sebastian Bacci for their work on this hearing. And finally, I want to thank my own legislative director, Clark Peña, for his assistance. And I would like now to invite uh, Majority Leader Combo uh, to give uh, her opening statement on her bill. Good morning. Chair Cabrera, can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. I am so excited and so excited to see you on this Zoom call today. You know that this is something that I've been waiting for. Um, 
and talking with you about for quite a few years now. So I'm so excited to be here. And I really wanted to thank you for the groundwork that you laid for this legislation to even be possible. When I first came into office, you and council member then, uh, Jamani Williams were instrumental um, in creating the cure violence model that we all know um, and is supporting our city and to see the both of you as the authors and archetypes of creating um, the gun violence task force that's done so much work in our community. It's an honor to take that work um, to the next level from the foundation that you set. You've changed a great deal in the city in terms of public safety. And I certainly thank you for that. And it's certainly proven to be a national model. When I first imagined this office, it was to address the very real need to be proactive in addressing the systemic causes of gun violence. I also wrote this bill to be a catalyst for victims and survivors by creating a network of services that are to be enacted in response to gun violence. I envision not just the criminality of gun violence prevention that policing addresses, namely illegal gun sales and trafficking, but to prevent gun violence by putting the onus back on the community support services and coordinated responses with other city agencies. We all know we have seen a surge in gun violence during the pandemic. Murders have increased by over 45% and shooting incidents have increased by 97%. Geographically, the majority of these shootings are concentrated within a small number of Brooklyn and Bronx neighborhoods. Being a representative of both North Crown Heights and parts of Bed-Stuy, two of the highest gun violence neighborhoods, I know this pain personally and consistently. We are a district that is plagued by gun violence daily. I'm here to speak for my neighbors, my family, my friends and constituents when I say that we need to do more. The Office for the Prevention of Gun Violence must address prevention from the standpoint of the entire person being supported in many ways, whether they are the victim or the survivors in the entire community. This need is great. We see schools that are having to help students process the impact of gun violence, teaching professionals becoming counselors, and parents need help intervening with children who are gang involved. So many parents know this, they understand what their children are going through, but do not know how to get the necessary help and support. And they don't want to do it in a way that would bring them into the criminal justice system. We need to provide that level of support for so many parents um, who are dealing with the challenges of everyday life, going to work, putting food on the table, but knowing that their children are being occupied by many levels of gang culture and want to do something about it, but don't have the tools to do so. We also must work with our cure violence providers to make sure that they have all of the tools necessary, such as professional development training, understanding annual reports, understanding how to file annual reports. Um, the city must work to provide the infrastructure and the capacity to help many of our cure violence providers who for the many, for the first time are operating and working with the city with governmental contracts for the first time. And it's critical that we make sure that they have the support so that they can do that work. I just also wanna make sure that we see this particular office as something we want to make sure that this office exists from administration to administration. This is an issue that the city, of course, is going to have to address in one way or the other. And it's important that the resources are there, both for the preventative purposes. You can't just say you've solved the gun violence issue. You always have to be working in prevention. And prevention essentially means providing our young people with the right resources, connections, opportunities, job training, skills, after school program, weekend programming. This office should always be doing that work. And I just wanna close um, with thanking so many people who have come forward um, to testify today. I wanna to thank you, Chair Cabrera. I wanna thank Tasha Young, uh, Jason Herr on my staff and Monica Aben previously, who helped us to establish this office in 2017. Um, and as part of my legacy, I certainly wanna see this office exist and continue to provide the necessary services so that we do not lose another child in the city of New York. Thank you. Thank you so much, Majority Leader. Thank you for your leadership on this bill uh, that is gonna help us to codify uh, into making sure that this office uh, continue to do the work. I saw it in my own district as well on 183rd Street of the Bragg program uh, and, and in St. James Park 
uh, area as well. Uh, we saw crime just go down. I mean, it works. Uh, it's, it's the most pragmatic way to deal with violence, gun violence. So uh, I commend you uh, for it. Uh, and with that, let me turn in now to Council Member Lewis, uh, who will uh, be uh, talking about uh, who is the sponsor of intro number 34 to give a statement. Good morning, Chair Cabrera, can you hear me? Perfectly. Perfect. Thank you Welcome. so much for holding today's hearing and for including intro 34. Um, a part of for today's hearing that I actually inherited from former member council member Cohen who introduced this bill two years ago. The 90 day period restricts us as elected officials from providing critical information to the community and limits important ways for us to, commun to communicate and both to engage with constituents, especially in times during like a pandemic where emails and social media is, is, is the best way for us to communicate with the community. So I thank you for having this bill being heard today in committee. I look forward to hearing from the administration, but most importantly, from the public so that the bill could operate the best way it needs to. So thank you so much, Chair Cabrera. I appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you again for your leadership on, on your bill. Looking forward to having a robust uh, discussion. And so with that, I will now turn it over to our moderator, committee council, CJ Murray to go over some of the procedural items. Thank you, Chair. I'm CJ Murray, Counsel to the Committee on Governmental Operations. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind our panelists that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. I will be calling on panelists to testify periodically throughout the hearing, so please listen for your name to be called. All hearing participants may submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. The first panelist to give testimony today will be representatives from the administration. From the New York City Campaign Finance Board, testimony will be provided by Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs, Eric Friedman. From the Mayor's Office to Prevent Gun Violence, Executive Director Jessica Mofield will be providing testimony. In addition, Eric Cumberbatch, Deputy Director of the Office of Neighborhood Safety, and Renita Francois, Executive Director of the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety, will be available to answer questions. There will be time for council member questions after each panel. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your question. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the bill sponsors and the committee chair. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Assistant Executive Director Friedman, Executive Director Mofield, Deputy Director Cumberbatch, and Executive Director Francois, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath once and then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth? the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions, Assistant Executive Director Friedman. Yes, I do. Thank you. Executive Director Mofield. Yes, I do. Thank you. Deputy Director Cumberbatch. I do. Thank you. Executive Director Francois. I do. Thank you. Uh, Assistant Executive Director Friedman, you may begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, and, and thanks to, to Chair Cabrera. Uh, thanks to members of the New York City Council Committee on Governmental Operations and for the other members who've joined us today. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify in intro number 34, sponsored by Council Member Farrah Lewis, which would shorten the statutory period of time during which city officials are prohibited from sending an official mass mailing to their constituents prior to an election from 90 days to 30 days. My name is Eric Friedman. I am the Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs at the New York City Campaign Finance Board. Under the city charter, public officials who are running for office are prohibited from using government resources to send mass mailings in the 90 days before an election. So the resources meant for governing are not diverted to an election related purpose. As you know, the CFB is responsible for ensuring compliance with this provision. 
The 90 day blackout period has provided strong protection against the misuse of city government resources. And the CFB supports keeping those protections in place. However, CFB does support some changes to these restrictions. There are exceptions in the charter so that officials may issue communications during the blackout period that are required by law, are necessary to safeguard public health and safety, are standard responses to inquiries, or are ordinary communications, <clears throat> excuse me, to members of the public. The charter provides little, if any, guidance on the scope of these exceptions, particularly on the question of what constitutes ordinary communications. The lack of detail requires CFB to evaluate each type of mailer that is presented to us in a very short time frame. CFB staff has worked well with the Office of the Council to the City Council, as well as staff in the offices of the Borough Presidents and citywide elected offices, to provide pre-clearance on certain mailings and ensure there is a common understanding of the standard. However, clearer language in the charter would provide more certainty for elected officials seeking guidance about what is appropriate. To provide clarity, the board recommends the council refine the exception to cover the provision of time-sensitive factual information that is of potential concern to the recipients. We look forward to working with council staff on this legislation and, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to Chair Cabrera for any questions. Thank you so much. And uh, Assistant Executive Director, thank you uh, for your testimony. I love testimonies that get to the point. Uh, and I, I just have a, a few questions, uh, but let me just share someone who have previously uh, ran against someone at the state level uh, who sold their mailers come in from the state. Uh, mines were caught off on 90 days It's a bit you know, you feel like at a disadvantage. Uh, and I, I relate with Council Member Lewis' uh, intention of this bill. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, uh, more detailed language, which I think is gonna, is gonna help us um, to, uh, to get to the finish line here. Uh, but let, let me just say, um, in terms of how, how do you identify how, how does CFB identify potential violations at the, uh, right now during the 90 day blackout rule? So the way that, um, that uh, sort of a, a review of these sort of mailers has worked, you know, generally, um, like um, our understanding is that at least in the city council side, a lot of, a lot of that review is done internally uh, in the office of the council. And, the councils, the councils of the council will will contact us with with um, potential questions. Uh, you know, during the the 2021 elections to date, we've received a little bit, a little more than 100 of these questions. Uh, that encompasses the council uh, as well as the borough president's offices and um, uh, and and other citywide elected officials. So, to our knowledge, and we'd have to do a little bit more research. Um, you know. But to our knowledge, in recent memory, there's been no violations issued for um, for any you know violation of the charter provision. Um, you know, we provided advice to, to offices. Sometimes uh, mailers will be revised um, so that they meet the standard in the charter. Um, and, and in other cases, you know, when we've suggested that a mailer uh, is not consistent with with those guidelines in the charter, then uh, those mailings won't go out. And if there were to be, and I'm happy to hear there were no uh, violations, uh, but if there were to be one, what would be the penalties? <sighs> I mean, hard to say, you know, I don't have the language of the charter in front of me. I, you know, the, the most, most penalties are, are capped at, at $10,000. I don't, I don't, you know, again, there's no precedent here. Um, you know, we've issued no violations for this, um, for this particular provision in the charter because that, that kind of pre-clearance has worked generally pretty well. Um, so there, you know, again, you know, what we have is a standard that allows council offices to communicate 
important relevant information to their constituents without you know seeing some of i think chair what, what you pointed out are some of these kind of barely disguised campaign mailers that come out of uh, offices at uh, at the state level um you know i think we talked a little bit about the assembly standard um, my understanding of, of the standard that is in assembly rules is that it is uh, there's a 30-day blackout before the primary 60 days before the general election but there are also it also provides for no exceptions um you know the standard uh, at the assembly level, as we understand it, is that that blackout period is, is, is a real blackout. Um, there are no mailings that go out in that last 30 days before the primary. Um, that provides a, a good, clear, bright line. Um, it, you know, it, it kind of reduces the sort of confusion about, about what, we can, what, what offices can and can't do. But it also means that you know, for certain important and relevant communications aren't going out at all uh, in those 30 days. Um, what we have at the city level um, again, it's a standard that allows for that, um, for that really important uh, information that's relevant to constituents um, to come out uh, while preventing, I think, what, you know, what I think you, you may have rightly identified as, as, uh, as kind of borderline abuse um, that, that might happen through some of these uh, state assembly or senate offices. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Let me turn it back to our moderator. Uh, so he could call up on uh, uh, members who may have questions. Thank you, Chair. I'll now call on council members in the order they've used the Zoom raise hand motion. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question and you've not yet raised your hand, please do so now. You'll have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. And Chair, seeing no hands raised, I'll turn it back to you for it. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, I see Councilmember Yeager has his hand raised. Uh, Councilmember Yeager. Starting time. Thanks. I'll be real quick, uh, Mr. Freeman. It's good to see you. Uh, most of your testimony focused on print mailings um, uh, and, and the preclearance that comes through uh, the city council, uh, general council, I suppose. Um, have you... Uh, how has the, the, the statute also applies to electronic mails as well, and how has that worked, if at all, if you've seen that? Are you getting requests from, uh, for directly from council members' offices or from borough presidents? Uh, sort of emails work in largely the same way that print mail does. Um, you know, we have gotten, you know, uh, emails to review um, from the office of the, uh, of the council to the city council. Most of, most of that traffic comes directly from the council's office. Um, and we have also heard from individual borough presidents. Um, you know, the, the, the controller was a, was, a, was, a, was a candidate for office. Public advocate was a candidate for, for re-election. So we've gotten some requests from those offices as well. Um, but, but sort of on a content basis, we're, you know, we're reviewing um, email communications uh, as well as uh, print communications. So, and... I, I guess what you kind of answered that you don't really have any uh, cases to highlight of anybody who's been penalized for having violated this provision of the charter. Have you, have you come across to your knowledge of uh, that there's been a review of any emails um, after they've been sent out that weren't pre-cleared uh, that you either had a problem with uh, or that you didn't have a problem with or you just pretty much confident that you're seeing everything on a pre-clearance basis? You know, I think, you know, we've certainly heard in the course of, uh, you know, in the course of an election from, from, from opponents, right? Challengers who, who, who may have gotten a hold of some mailing that, um, you know, that they feel may have gone over the line. But I, I think in, in practically every case, um, we've, seen, we've seen them before they, they've gone out. I think we have a really, I think, strong working relationship at this point with, uh, with with staff uh, again, not just at the city council, um, but uh, at borough president's offices uh, and the other offices. Um, I, I think what's 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 great about this again, every office you know is taking it seriously, um, wants to be sure that they are on the right side of the charter. Um, and again, you know, I think what we our experience has been that um, that that most relevant, um, useful information to constituents. You know, is getting out, um, and, and and you know the, the the what the provision does is it kind of requires everyone to sit down and evaluate 
um, whether these communications are, are truly aimed at providing constituents with important information, um, you know, uh, and, and kind of helping to kind of provide a backstop and ensure that some of the more, um, some of these pieces that might be indistinguishable from campaign mail um, so aren't, to, being, aren't being sent. To just to clarify your position, just correct me if I'm, I'm mischaracterizing it, but is it that the, that you support reducing the time to 30 days and you think the statute, the proposed introduction should be clearer or that you think that it should remain at 90 days and put more clarity into how the statute is supposed to work? Our testimony is that the window should remain at 90 days because we think it's worked well. Um, we, think, we think that, uh, you know, that relationship we have uh, that kind of provides that layer of review um, has been a good, has also provided protection to the extent that um, you know members believe that the provision has restricted them from getting useful and important information out to constituents. Um, clear, clear language around, especially around this idea of ordinary communications, might help. Um, okay. And we're more than happy to, to to kind of explore that further. Okay, so just just two quick things. One is, um, uh, and the clock is running out, so. I'm not going to leave this as a question, but just a suggestion. Have you, if you haven't submitted a proposed uh, introduction or proposed language for what you think the charter should say on the exceptions, uh, um, you should. And then just the second question is, have you, do you recall, if you know, have you actually told existing elected officials no on a proposed mail? This is not good. You shouldn't do this. It, it exceeds the uh, exceptions in the charter. Uh, there's a small number of those um, from this election. Um, I think it might be as many as 15 uh, out, of, out of the more than 100 requests we've gotten. Um, you know, I, I don't have details on, on each one that I can share today, but if it's something that um, my, my, you're interested in hearing more about, happy to provide. I'm expired. My clock is, my clock is expiring, so just re real quick. Um, on those, if you know, again, uh, Eric, if you, on those that, that you had a problem with, were they fixable in terms of changing language or content or were they, you know, thumbs down, you can't send this out? Uh, I think it's a mixture. Like we've worked with, we certainly worked with, um, worked with folks to help ensure that, like in some cases it's, it's kind of, uh, it's, 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 hey, you know, can you, can you take the photo out? That, that's, that's um, you know, and, and, and offices have been able to send out mail. Um, you know, after modifications and others, like the nature of it has, has, has been kind of outside uh, the guidelines that the charter sets and then we've had to-, to, right. to then I'm done. I just, um, no. because of the nature of the questions, I, I just want to uh, just state for the record that I have not sent any uh, uh, mail out of my government office at all this year, either electronic or, uh, or otherwise. Um, so just to clarify that these questions didn't pertain to me personally, I just wanted to make sure that's on the record. All right, I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Committee Council. Uh, Chair, I see no further questions. So if it's okay with you, we'll move on to the next panel. Please. Great. Uh, next, we'll hear testimony from Jessica Mofield of the Mayor's Office to Prevent Gun Violence. Executive Director Mofield, you may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. My name is Jessica Mofield, and I am an Executive Director within the Office of Neighborhood Safety. I'm joined today by my colleague, Renita Francois, Executive Director within the Office of Neighborhood Safety, and Eric Cumberbatch, a Deputy Director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about Intro 66 and Mock J's work within the city's public safety continuum. Mock J advises the mayor on criminal justice policy and runs several programs and justice initiatives from the New York City crisis management system to alternatives to incarceration and supervised release. We work with law enforcement agencies and personnel, other city agencies, service providers, not-for-profits, foundations, and the public to implement effective strategies that make the city safer, fairer, and one having a smaller criminal justice footprint while improving system coordination. Recognizing the interconnected and holistic nature of public safety and historically disinvested communities that also experienced the brunt of over-policing and heightened levels of gun violence, in December of 2019, the city launched the Office of Neighborhood Safety. 
ONS, housed within Mock J, is a crucial component of the public safety continuum and is necessary as part of our effort to co-produce public safety in partnership with local communities. ONS combines the efforts from the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety, also known as MAP, the Office to Prevent Gun Violence, OPGV, and ATLAS to share resources and holistic assistance for New Yorkers affected by violence. ONS teams work with our network of residents, community leaders to ensure that more New Yorkers have the agency and ability to define public safety directly for themselves. As such, ONS relies on the strength, experience, and expertise of community as guiding principles and is committed to ensuring that marginalized communities have access to capital and opportunities. As part of the launch of ONS, Atlas was created to build on the foundations of MAP and OPG's approach to foster deep relationships, invest resources, and support both for people released pretrial and for the communities that they call home. Given these initiative goals of enhancing safety, Atlas, OPGV, and MAP serve overlapping populations in the city's highest crime neighborhoods. All three are a part of a larger effort to reduce violence and prevent and minimize criminal justice involvement by addressing the root causes of violence that have disproportionately impacted ONS service communities. I will share here a few more details about MAP, Atlas, and OPGV portfolios. MAP launched uh, in July of 2014 following a spike of shootings in some of the city's public housing development. Over the past seven years, MAP has become an internationally recognized model by how residents co-create safety in their communities through innovative problem solving. Its signature initiative, Neighborhood Stat, brings together residents, community stakeholders, and city agency representatives to identify and solve public safety and quality of life issues. Residents take the lead in safety realization efforts through partnerships with community organizations and various city agencies, including the Police Department, Parks Department, Department of the Aging, NYCHA, and the Department of Sanitation. MAP sites across the city have experienced substantial drops in crime over the last five years as compared to similar sites without the program. ATLAS seeks to address the risks and needs of individuals released pre-trial on their own recognizance who are at high, heightened risk of future victimization or justice system involvement. The program offers therapeutic services to address past trauma, mentorship, education, and employment opportunities, and entry into supportive community networks. Launched in 2014, OPGV works to address gun violence through a shift in societal norms and the work of community members in mediating disputes to prevent shootings. The crisis management system deploys teams of credible messengers and community members whose backgrounds allow them to connect with and motivate at-risk individuals. The 29 sites where they implement the cure violence model in mediating conflicts on the street and direct New Yorkers to resources that can create peace, support healing, and this also includes a year-round employment program, mental health services, trauma counseling, and other opportunity-related center resources. This initiative has brought measurable benefits to communities citywide. Researchers have found that across EMS sites, shooting victimizations fell by over 28% over the first 24 months following a site launch compared to the 24 months prior to the launch with gun injuries down 33%. Researchers also found that CMS increased trust in police and decreased residents' reliance on violence to settle disputes. As part of the city's historic investment in public safety and in partnership with the city council, the mayor has increased his investment and commitment to the crisis management system by doubling the city's investment in FY22. The administration continues to increase and improve its commitment to innovative programming that enhances safety within community. I especially would like to thank the council and bill sponsor, Majority Leader, Majority Leader Cumbo, for providing the opportunity to strengthen ONS work through Intro 66, which would amend the city charter to codify the Office to Prevent Gun Violence. The administration is grateful for the council's support, and we look forward to working with you to amend the bill to strengthen it even further by addressing root causes that challenge public safety. 
Amending Intro 66 to include the work of the interdependent initiative that comprise the Office of Neighborhood Safety will provide the necessary stability to continue this work far into the future. In addition to providing stability to the ONS portfolio, Intro 66 also honors the administration's and the council's joint commitment reflected in Resolution 1584, the police reform plan that the council approved in March of this year. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony on ONS work, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to hear about the work that you have done and have accomplished. As you can imagine, you know how I feel about this in light of the fact of we saw, you know, myself and council member Germani Williams, now he's the public advocate. We saw it at his very inception and, uh, and where you have taken it is well, well beyond uh, the imagination of, of what all the founders were there, uh, who were there uh, and in the discussions that took place there. I have to tell you this, anybody have a discussions about cure violence, uh, about uh, the work that you guys do, I always say that we have literally the best program nationwide. Uh, and the results uh, that you have brought forth is, is tangible, visible, uh, and life-saving. And so I can't say enough, there's not enough adjectives to praise the work that you guys have done. And, I, and like I mentioned before, I've seen it in my own district, uh, literally saving lives. Uh, Kingsbridge area started the Bragg program there. We were having some big problems there. Now, since the inception, we haven't had uh, in those 10 block uh, area, we haven't had one gun shooting. I mean, it's amazing. And before that, it, it, it was getting very dangerous um, because of the gun shooting that, that was taking place. So I salute you, I commend you, and I admire the work that you guys are doing. Uh, I wanted to ask you one question. I want to turn it over and I want to recognize we've been joined by Council Member Levin, who also will have a question in, in Majority Leader Combo here in a second. But I just want to I have many other questions, but I just want to ask one key question. You mentioned that you would like to see the bill improve. Can you give us a specifics? Do you have uh, any specific how would you like to have the bill improve? So in terms of improving, I think it's more so about being able to build upon the foundation that we talked about through the three initiatives, um, being able to continue to be innovative and continue to build upon the work that you all have been at, at the forefront of leading so that this can actually take place. So when we, we use the phrase improve, it's just the, the space and grace to continue to grow and evolve in this work under the codification under the codification of the, the Office of Neighborhood Safety. Thank you so much. Let me turn it over now to the sponsor of the bill, Cheese. I have to tell you, she's been, uh, she's been a vanguard for this bill. She was relentless. We gotta pass this bill before I get out. <laughs> I'm termed out uh, in the council. So I had to uh, salute her for, for again, uh, She's been fighting for this bill and uh, it's so good to have uh, her uh, join us. And I know she has some questions Then I'm gonna turn it over to Council Member Levin. Uh, we need to unmute majority leader. There you go. Okay, thank you so much. Um... Yes, this, this certainly is um, an exciting day. And I, so everyone at Mock J, a lot of friends here, but I'm gonna go beyond the friend role and y'all still love me afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. 
because I really want to get to the heart of some of these questions, you know, and it's, and it's not because the role, and I know that you all share this, the role is to get to the solution. And it's hard to play all these different sides when you're trying to get to the solution. But my main goal with this bill is twofold, but I'll go to the second part of it, was really so that we could have a comprehensive agency response an agency when i say agency i mean many different agencies from it could be from acs to nycha to dycd to department of cultural affairs to mental health like an interagency response um board of education to to each shooting in the city of new york that's gun violence related um how close do you think we are to achieving that goal? Are there enough resources to achieve that goal? And the reason why I ask is because as a council member, and we've spoken about this often, when we go in to try and handle a shooting in our district, the needs of the victim and of the community are so deep that as a council member, you can't provide the level of support that that family needs individually and to do the regular day-to-day -day work of this job. And it also becomes very mentally, um, for lack of better words, I would say draining in many ways because many families that I've connected to, you become their source of mental health support and you become um, who they lean on. You know, I get many calls at midnight, many calls at you know, all throughout the week, but they can be screaming calls, they can be angry calls, they can be yelling calls, they can be hang up calls. It's, it's, it's this type of pain that so many people are experiencing. And I know it's not just the mom, but it can be an entire school, it can be an entire building, it can be, it can be a whole community. So how close are we in that? And and does this office need to be funded at an even higher level to, to reach that level of a goal? So thank you for the question. And I think it, it's a question that's spot on with, with our philosophy and, and uh, overall framework. So we, we definitely view uh, preventing gun violence as an interagency and interdisciplinary practice. Um, which includes going beyond traditional law enforcement and prosecution, but really being proactive and properly culturally competent in responses with community-based organizations, individuals, and then also the city agency structures that have impact on people's lives and community. So with most shootings that we respond to, it's never just a siloed approach. Um, we play a role as a hub switching stations for the city. Um, we work across city agencies. We work across CBOs. We work with victims and alleged perpetrators um, in the effort to prevent violence, in the effort to heal individuals that have been harmed uh, by violence, and also to prevent retaliation. Um, as we continue to grow and, and ultimately codify this office, building out our capacity is critical. Um, right now, we have a staff of roughly 21 individuals, um, but as we grow and continue to, to see this great need to link services together, link agencies together, and work across systems, we need to build our capacity as well um, within uh, the Office of Neighborhood Safety. When you say when we respond to a shooting, how do you all make the determination that this is a shooting that's going to get the full weight of this office? This is one that we're gonna wrap our entire arms around with that level of support. What makes, yeah. what makes a situation rise to that occasion? So I would say every shooting is just as important as, as the next one. So we, we never wanna look at an individual shooting incident and diminish um, the impact that it has on the family, the community, and, and the individual, and any and all of those involved. So every shooting we, we take seriously. Um, we're, we're not geographically based in every location in New York City. So we don't have the capacity, depth, and outreach to be everywhere. 
Um, now, in the areas where we have our program boundaries, our program operations, that is where we focus primarily all of our resources on. Anything that impacts those areas, that's what would get the greatest magnitude of our service uh, provision. We do go outside of our areas to assist in other districts, other precincts um, that may have shooting incidents where we can lend services. Um, but primary, our primary focus are the areas in which we are targeted um, and have very strategic um, efforts in place. What would you say um, in terms of one of the questions that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a bit complicated, but let's say with shootings in our city, in our different communities, how long would you say you have both the capacity to follow victims of gun violence and their families? So, you know, the trauma of a shooting lasts for a very long time. And a lot of people are still dealing with the psychological impact of it. Do you, do, does the city and or does the office have at its fingertips the level of mental health practitioners that is needed to address this? So I think that's a great question and you know, coming out of COVID, um, the initial impact of COVID-19, a lot of our work um, was really geared and centered uh, around victim services. And a lot of our efforts were really, you know, moving people from dangerous situations, make, ensuring families had access to victim services, uh, burial funds or supportive care, group networks, um, linking family members to uh, supportive networks within CMS. Um, and that, that was a, a, a huge undertaking um, by, by our office. I think as a city, as a whole, um, the amount of harm that has been done um, as a result of COVID-19, um, losing individuals um, through the pandemic, but then also having a pandemic on top of an ongoing endemic or the epidemic of gun violence, um, this syndemic has really took its toll on community. And I think we, we can never have enough um, culturally competent healing um, organizations, individuals in community. And if there was ever a time to increase that, it's now. I wanna make a suggestion from, um, and then go into a bit more questions. I think from my experiences with the mental health protocols with the city is that for many communities of color, mental health is such a foreign dynamic in terms of something that we access for help that I believe that a person should be seen five or six times before all of the protocols and bureaucracy of getting that mental health happens. So for example, when you go, you know, there's a question of, do you have insurance? We want you to fill out these forms. Do you have a check or money order or payable so that you can pay for these mental health services? Do you have this? Can you access that? I feel like with many people that they are in such need of support and assistance that going through the bureaucracy I have found has turned a lot of people off and they just say, oh, they wanted $75 from me. Oh, they wanted a copay. Oh, they wanted all my insurance. I didn't have insurance. Oh, they wanted these things. I feel like we need to change that so that we can at least pe get people in and then start to talk about later on down the road, do they have these things once we've received them, made them comfortable, gotten them to see the, the goal of what it is that we're doing um, and, and how this can be a resource of help and support. As well as, you know, I, I've also heard a lot about many of the spaces that people go to are not so welcoming or not the most therapeutic of environments where they seem more, 
they seem more like they're tr like trauma spaces in a sense. And, and it further makes people say like, I don't want to be in this space or I don't want to be here. So it's, you know, when you, when you have the money to pay for mental health services, the spaces are really nice with comfortable couches and leather this and nice tablecloth that I'm not necessarily saying that, but I'm saying something that's more, um, comfortable and welcoming um, to individuals. I also wanted to ask, um, I noticed with the Vision Zero um, campaign that with the legislation came a whole marketing campaign. And I feel like marketing is really important where they would have the billboards that would talk about it. You know, if you're going 50 miles per hour versus 25 miles per hour, what could have happened, what it would have looked like. And these are like all over the place. Has there ever been any sort of budget put forward from this office in terms of like, you know, you're having people like, let's say Taj Gibson from the New York Knicks, who's doing a lot of work on this saying da 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 about it. You're, you're having a lot of the people in the NBA in the hip hop industry and all these spaces and places. And when it's go orange month for gun violence awareness month, we turn the whole city orange and we talk about it and we have all of this because I've, I feel like there's this thing where the city wants to address gun violence, but they also don't wanna put it out there that we have a gun violence issue in our city, but you need to have the same level of citywide campaign with the same level of, um, you know, like if you were to put a picture of me saying like gun violence is not the way to go, that's not going to have the type of impact as Taj Gibson saying that that's not the way to go. And I just call him because I'm not much into basketball and he's probably the only <laughs> ball player I know right now. But I'm just saying in that sense, we need to have like a citywide campaign with credible messengers who young people look up to um, for help, for support. You know, because we're, we're asking young people to change their way of thinking. And when you get into that space, you often need someone to speak to when you're that angry. You need someone to walk you off the ledge, in a sense, from hurting or harming someone else. It's kind of the same, you know, it's some kind of the same dynamics as suicide prevention, like creating ways and spaces for young people to channel their energies in other ways, but also to say that, you know, that maybe some of the same industries that might have glorified this are now saying this is not the way to go. Yeah, so I, I want to touch on uh, first the recommendation solution that you, you, you gave, um, which I think is spot on and critical um, to providing any quality of uh, service and care, especially after um, a horrific incident. So. Um, removing barriers and, and really ensuring um, that people aren't faced with bureaucracy in times of crisis is definitely part of what we do um, as we work with individuals on the ground and how they relate across government and how they relate across agencies. So that's, that's always um, part of our work. Um, we approach this work from the standpoint that oftentimes agency and government do harm, more harm to the community as opposed to healing. So our approach is actually spot on with what your recommendation and solution um, is, is embodies. Um, in terms of the campaign, um, we've launched several campaigns over the years. Um, we do have active campaigns. Jessica is going to speak towards the, the campaigns. I think uh, our approach is that we don't want the city to um, not be involved with, in addressing gun violence. We want everyone to feel um, that gun violence impacts us all. Um, regardless of if a shooting incident takes place in Brownsville, we want the Upper West Side to feel the magnitude and, and the weight to, I need to do something about that. Any New Yorker, every New Yorker, when a New Yorker is harmed, we're all harmed. So Jessica, can you talk more about the, the campaigns that we have? Sure, so the campaign that we, we currently have active is the Stay Strong, Stay Safe campaign. And that really talks about the intersectionality between uh, gun violence and also COVID. So what we use is a social media campaign where we actually 
leverage all of the zip codes that had the highest um, the highest propensity and rates for not only COVID, but also gun violence in black and brown communities. And geo-targeted all of those zip codes to ensure that when people are on their social media, we're meeting them where they're at. We're meeting them where they receive information. And it was really about lifting up the men and women of the crisis management system that do this work every single day. Not only them, but also clergy leaders um, in community that play an essential role in what safety looks like. You know, you talked about healing and, you know, yes, healing is talking, but also it's somatic and how we feel it in our body. So also understanding that there's a role for everyone to play, whether it's our spiritual advisors, whether it's our neighbors, whether it's our partners, you know, really lifting up what these individual stories look like to ensure that everyone knows that although these circumstances happen to you, there's a role for you in this. There's a role for you to be a part of what healing looks like across community and really stopping gun violence. So we have that on our Stay Strong NYC website. And you know, you also spoke about the ability to use influencers, pro-social influencers that have a role in really heightening the level and visibility of what these community storytelling campaigns look like. So we have partnered with Tracy Morgan and Rosario Dawson uh, for this particular campaign to be a part of our flagship video, also with young people. And in addition to that, we've also leveraged radio uh, during critical times throughout the year, whether it's right before Memorial Day weekend, as you know, the unofficial kickoff, right before Labor Day, and also, you know, pre-COVID when we had, you know, a, a weekend with no shooting, we was able to amplify the voices of our community members by partnering with iHeartRadio to do that. Uh, we've also created poster makers in the past where we was able to leverage uh, the likeness and social media of the Breakfast Club. So. We actually have a, a call to action for, for any influencer that has a huge social media calling to join us in putting out messages for people to stand up to teeth because I think the biggest thing in not only talking about behavior and cultural change for community, those narratives and messages also humanize people and allow for even greater and deeper interagency connection because it's changing culture within those agencies as well once they have access to those stories. I think. I think that's a good foundation and I think that's headed in the right direction. I guess I'm a bit out of tune. I haven't really felt um, or experienced it in my, <clears throat> in my day to day. I kind of think like s something similar to the, the taking the knee approach, something like that. Like, I feel like gun violence in our community has not really been condemned in a big way. And I feel like because it's not condemned in a big way, because it's both psychological, because you realize that when someone pulls a trigger, you're ending your life as well as their life, right? So two families and, and, and the subsequent community are both harmed. So it's hard to like, it's hard to attack in your own community when that happens because you, you're now knowing that two families are going to be impacted in the same way, but there's nothing that there's, I've never really, you know, I mean, just speaking honestly, like there's so many celebrities that have come from New York city, from Jay-Z to Nas, to Puff Daddy, to all these basketball players, to all of this. There's nobody that's out there. That's really like, nah, man, that's not the way, you know, that's not cool. That's not what we support. That's not what we, you know, there's no NBA night where they say like, you know, we're condemning this violence in our communities. Like this thing has to be like full, it has to be a full campaign that is in every single thing that we see and do because it's it's it, it's kind of treated as a neutral thing in our community. It's neither highlighted nor condemned. It just happens and people kind of in their own silos have to deal with the aftermath of it, the reality of it, but there's nothing that's really condemning it um, in that kind of way. So I'll, I'll just, cause I know I don't want to take the entire time away from my colleagues and I have other questions and I would like for them to get in before we lose those and hopefully we can come back to me. I just wanted to, you know, follow up finally with the question around the office that I would like to see it do is more capacity building. Um, you all understand that many of these organizations for the first time are dealing with government contracts or dealing with accountants or dealing with, um, and while many of them, of course, have 
obvious, clear business minds. Dealing with a contract with the city is a lot for a master's degree graduate in public administration, like, or, or not-for-profit administration. It is a lot to throw a new organization into. Has there been a thought about there being almost like an office within the office to handle the back end of a lot of this work? Because as you know, in my district, where a group in our district is having the same types of issues and it essentially means that they are unable to perform the services that they were contracted to do. So has there been a thought about putting forward an office within the office to work alongside, to do training, to help with support, to keep the 990s, the tax returns, the accounting, all of that um, in, in, in order? Absolutely. We're actually moving in that direction right now. Through the release of the crisis management RFP that went live yesterday, we are actually doing that in partnership with United Way, where the backbone of what it is that they do with communities is capacity building, linking them to private and public partnerships, and also working with them to make sure that they have, you know, access to HR right infrastructure support. So human resources development, how do you develop fiscal reports? How do you present to your board? How do you create a board? What do board resolutions look like? So really thinking about the infrastructure of removing organizations away from bureaucracy and partnering with an organization that could provide uh, the scaffolding support for them to have capacity building because these are essentially social enterprises, although they are nonprofits, and we want them to be successful so that they can continue the innovative work to really be community hubs. Um, I, I'm glad to see that a lot of the things that we're discussing are things that are in the works. I'll turn it over to my colleague, turn it back to uh, Council Member Chair Cabrera, and perhaps it can go back to me later on. <laughs> we would love that. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, Majority Leader. Committee Council, I believe that we have also Council Member Levin, and then uh, uh, I'll ask some questions. Starting time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. <clears throat> I apologize. Um, I'm I, I'm homesick, and I got my two-year-old running around, so I apologize for any noise. Um, so um, I, I just want to first off um, uh, thank um, our majority leader for this legislation. I'm excited to see it pass, um, and I'm and thank you, Chair, for conducting this hearing. Um, to the team from Mock J. Um, I, I have a, a lot of respect for the work that you do. Um, uh, I wanna thank uh, Renita for being part of um, uh, the group that um, worked through a restorative justice initiative that we're going to be um, hopefully seeing funded starting at the beginning of the year that came out of um, the, this is, uh, the, the process that closed Rikers. Um, uh, uh, I know that um, you know, through that through that process, I became familiar with the work that Eric does, and um, you know from the people that I uh, know and and um, uh, trust their opinion. Um, what I've heard is that um, Eric does some of the, the best and most important work in the entire city, um, and um, and is a model that. Um, uh, in, in his ability to cut through bureaucracy um, and uh, get resources to the communities that need them, um, that he does just remarkable work. So I want to just acknowledge my appreciation for that. Um, uh, and then I'd, I want to make sure that I don't miss an opportunity um, because I only have a couple of months left in the council um, to um, express my. Um, my strong desire to see um, the MAP program expanded into um, two developments in my district, uh, Gowanus Houses and White Cloth Gardens. I know that uh, the MAP program is um, nearby in Red Hook. And um, you know, as we're going through the Gowanus rezoning process right now, um, you know, I've made it clear, because uh, this is coming from the community at Gowanus itself and at White Cloth itself, um, that what the community wants more than um, 
you know, new capital investments into their um, developments, which are important. Um, but uh, they also want um, uh, the human infrastructure that, that the MAP program can bring. And so I'm going to be advocating over the next few weeks um, uh, to see a MAP program funded and expanded um, into those two developments. Um, um, you don't have to comment about that, but I give you the heads up. Um, and I, I, my, my one question is, so, you know, there's, and I don't mean to be provocative here, but, um, uh, you know, I, I saw an opinion piece in the New York Post today about, um, about gun violence in, in, in um, particularly from 2020 and 2021 in New York City. Um, and the increase in the number of shootings and the increase in the number of homicides. And, um, and everybody seems to have um, an opinion about why this is happening in our city, but nobody has any data about it or any real insight. If you read this, uh, this opinion piece today, it, it, you know, it basically uh, points a finger at you know, the politicians um, which is fine, but it doesn't it doesn't really support it with any hard data, nor does it take into account other considerations like, you know, that shootings have gone up all around the country in, in uh, cities all around the country in the last um, several years. And um, New York is not um, is not immune to that. And, um, you know, and, and frankly, we see the police commissioner publishing, I think, just last week, um, in an opinion piece. Um, stating that he thinks that the reason is for the increase is bail reform. And I was just wondering if, if uh, your team at MACCHE has, you know, I, I mean, I'm assuming you're, you're, you're considering this and thinking about it. And if you have any thoughts on, on why this is happening and, and you know, what a, what a, a good long-term strategy is to, um, to bring gun violence but, but especially why we think over the last two years we've seen this. Time expired. Thank you. I'll, I'll take the question. Um, I think at, at the core, communities of color have for a very long time experienced um, adverse social determinants. Um, and the infrastructure, the agency, um, what is supposed to be the supports for community have never um, stepped up to fulfill its, its, its overall mandate. Um, and the fracture that happened in, in and during COVID-19 um, only exacerbated that. So a lot of the, the social supports, whether they were ideal or not, um, just the fracturing of that with people alone um, a lot of those things serve, um, even though as we, we may not see the connectivity as um, public safety stewards or, or public safety supports or mental health supports or social support. Um, but all of those things were fractured in the most vulnerable communities amongst the most vulnerable individuals. Um, and then we see things like gun violence um, played out. But it doesn't stop with gun violence. It's also suicide. It's also um, so many other harms that are happening uh, across community. Um, so I, I think the fracturing of um, social supports um, and the, the recognition that the supports that are in um, black and brown communities have never been up to capacity for the need um, that's there to support the individual. And I, I think, um, you know, gun violence has been endemic in black and brown communities and has not been lifted to the level um, to really address that need. And when we talk about a pandemic coming in on top of an epidemic, um, that synergistic effect, we're seeing the results and, and the outcomes and we're, we're in, the, in the midst of battling that. So that's my humble opinion. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cumberbatch. It, do, do you, um, 
do you see um sorry i got my second um do you see the, the investment in in your effort being um being enough right now or do you think that do you think that 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 this is a question of dollars and cents in terms of resources or are there other kind of programmatic resources that you um that you could that you could use from um from the city and other and other uh, partnerships from the state or federal government as well yeah welcome all partnership um i think we, there's always a need for further resources we're we're, we're under resourced and there, there's a need for resources, but not just throwing money at problems or issues, really letting data drive us and evidence inform um, what the interventions need to look like and how we continue to build and tailor them. I think council member Levin, yes. Lastly, uh, um, when, you, when it comes to data, what um, what partners are you working with? Which partners are you working with in terms of academic institutions or um, you know, or other types of um, uh, uh, resources to help to help drive that um, the question around uh, qualitative and quantitative data? Yeah, so we work very closely with John Jay. Um, they follow a lot of the, the efforts that we have on the ground. They've done numerous studies um, that show the, 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 the work and, and um, its effect on community, its effect on individuals, uh, behaviors, um, propensity to use violence, um, uh, shootings and homicide rates, uh, declining in areas where we, we have interventions. So, you know, we, we have a, a great set of data that exists. Um, for this work, and then we also work with Mache Research, um, and I myself, I work with um, researchers from across the country um, that, that support this effort as well. Council Member Levin? I think he's occupied. With a hey, all, all, all good, Chair, sorry. <laughs> Your old duty. Sorry, but yes. Yeah, thank you very much to the Machi team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member, and and that is indeed a greater mission. Uh, I, I have a few questions here. I I, I want to follow up in that question. What what is, when we're talking about in an ideal world, how much more resources would you need in order for this bill uh, to if I may, quote unquote, be fully funded, so you could accomplish the mission that's been set before you. I, I don't know an exact number. I think you know we can talk through what expansion looks like, and I think that would be the next exercise of really looking at um, where we need to be in the city, uh, what, with what types of interventions, where those touch points are. Um, and then, of course, to how we can grow to scale. Um, so I think that's an exercise that, that would have to happen. Um, but I, I can say at this point, you know, we, we are significantly expanded into areas across the city. It takes time for programs to come to scale, um, build up, and actually show evidence. But ideally, I think um, more expansion is, is necessary. Um, and I think use, utilizing um, public health approaches to address public safety concerns um, is the, the right way to move forward. I, I mean, are we ready for expansion right now, or are we just trying to solidify the programs that are already expanding uh, so they could, you know, function at 100 percent? Yeah, I, I think in order to load on um, what we're building, um, we really have to get this infrastructure um, solidified. So I would say expansion is for future growth, future, um, you know, vision. But right now, I think we're at a, a, a point where we need to be, we need to have stability where we are right now. And I think that's um, building the, the staffing capacity of ONS, 
um, to strengthen what is being deployed in community. How many more staff do you need in your office right now? How many staff does the police department have? <laughs> I, I would say, <laughs> you know, we we, we want to be comparable to um, other other city offices um, that exist. So, you know, when we first started this, we started this with one one person. Then we scaled to two, three. Um, right now, with with the merger between the Office to Prevent Gun Violence, Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety, and Atlas, we're roughly at 22 people. Um, and it's very important for everyone to understand that, you know, these services are interdependent. Um, and OPGB's focus is primarily on individuals um, and changing culture. And MAP is focused on environmental um, concerns and the structures that, how, how the structures relate to people and Atlas uh, wrapping families around with supports. So, you know, as we build those structures and think about expanding, it's, it's really not only expanding just office to prevent gun violence, um, but if we're going to do this from a holistic approach, it's expanding in all three of those areas. And I really believe, you know, it's, it's a substantial uh, expansion. Yeah, you know, if you could start uh, coming up there are people in the Zoom call who's going to have, you know, who are going to be voices in the into the next administration, and so it will be helpful if we have that now. You know, when I mean now, I mean in the next couple of months. So that could be spoken into the next administration. So you know, there won't be a lag uh, in terms of planning and in terms of projecting uh, the needs uh, for the office. I had a couple of more questions. I know uh, Councilmember Diaz has questions too. I uh, wanted to ask you, you know, as you know, the Office uh, to Prevent Gun Violence is now housed within the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety. What was the goal behind this move? And how has this move affected the work of the Office to Prevent Gun Violence? I think uh, well, first, the, the, the thought or the, the, the idea behind this is that all of these programs enhance one another. Um, so if, if we're going to do um, initiatives, roll out initiatives that address public safety, they should be tied together um, because it only increases the impact and the touch points. Um, all of the programs, as I, as I previously stated, um, play off each other in different roles. So as OPGV may be working with an individual, um, that individual also has a residence. And that residence may be where MAP is doing services. And there's agencies and other organizations that have an impact in that environment. And MAP may be coordinating those agencies and, and those organizations on how they react and respond to all of the residents in that community. And then we may have justice involved young people in that area as well. Um, Atlas then wraps those families with function family uh, therapy and, and other resources and support. So it's uh, a cumulative effect um, to be uh, as beneficial um, and intentional in these areas as possible, addressing it um, through, through multiple disciplines. All right, my last question is in regards, uh, you know, as the bill gives the director of the office uh, to prevent gun violence a number of concrete powers and duties, how do these compare to the director's current responsibilities? I, I think ultimately, um, you know, as we grow, we're, we're seeking to have um, more autonomy and more independence. And I think ultimately codifying this will, will provide um, that type of um, launching point, so to speak, where, you know, right now we're in an office, within an office, um, and so forth. I think we would be at a place um, where we can stand alone. Got it. So, so within that model, maybe it, 
it doesn't, we should look at whether does it continue to make sense to be under the mayor's office of neighborhood safety if you want it to be independent, it's something that we should have that level of discussion. So you could have autonomy because, you know, the last thing is too many hands in the, in the pot trying to cook this, this meal, uh, so to speak. Uh, so, so with that, let me turn it over uh, to council member Diaz. And then I believe majority leader has another question. Good morning and, and thank you, Chair Gabriela, for the conversation. Majority Leader also for bringing this intro forward. Mark, I, we're, we're no strangers. <laughs> As you know, the 37 Consumatic District does not have a pure violence group that works with us. Can you give me some more information in reference to the crisis management RFP that's out? Had I not been sitting in this conversation, I would have not known of it. So the RFP that was released yesterday focuses mm -hmm. on 31 communities across the city uh, for our community-led approaches to public safety. So it's in the 7-5, which you're talking about specifically. Um, and it also includes Franklin Clay Lane that falls within your district uh, for school conflict mediation services. So there's about five different schools that are within that campus that we're looking to expand to in addition to ensuring that we have a holistic approach to community healing and wellness. So that RFP allows us to be able to have a diverse group of partners uh, that allows us to extend our, our tentacles not only into communities, but also school campuses that are in dire need of having touch points uh, with individuals that are able to mediate conflict and also to connect them to the network of services that they provide. What we will be sending out shortly because we want this to be a totally inclusive process to involve all levers and actors of community, we will be inviting you all to participate in our evaluation committees so that not only does it encompass community members, it also has the council districts and also city agency partners that are integral to ensuring that this ecosystem to support community actually works. And we have people that represent those communities being a part of that. I thank you for your reply. I look forward to more detailed conversation. Lane is one out of my three hot spots in the 37 council Matter district. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity. Thank, thank you. you so, and thank you so much, council member. I, I just want to point a clarification that 31 uh, is not an addition of what we have, right? It's 31 overall. So oh, there'll, be two, there'll be two additional, um, two in the Bronx, it'll be in the 4-0 and also in the 44th percent uh, that we will see new sites for FY23, so the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, I'm so happy to hear uh, that it's coming to the Bronx. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, you know, I have to root for the Bronx, come on. Okay. Uh, Majority Leader, you, you have stated that you had another question, or, or is that pretty much it? Just one additional question. Yeah. Um, and many of it was covered during your questions, but I wanted to know, at this time, what agencies are included in your interagency approach to addressing um, each shooting in our districts? Sure, so it really runs the gamut between NYCHA, HRA, DHS, um, HPD, the Department of the Aging, sometimes it includes ACS, the Department of Education, um, DYCD, especially when it pertains to incidents that occur in close proximity to cornerstones and or have young people that are participants of cornerstones, um, and sometimes even parks. So it's sanitation. Uh, so it really, really runs the spectrum of what's actually happening, not only with that family in that community or in that particular service area. I would also like to make the recommendation to include the Department of Cultural Affairs in that um, listing of agencies. And um, I think for the incoming, I think what would be helpful for the incoming council members, because there will be so many coming in, I think it would be good for them to understand how to work best with your office in terms of how do they work with your office to handle a shooting um, within their district? What are the resources? What are the um, 
what are the things that they can do to provide for a family so that they can be that intermediary to resources and services. Um, I also just want to add in closing that um, I think that it's important that the new incoming class just get that proper training because it can be a very overwhelming experience attempting to address issues of gun related violence in our districts. And I think that that would be um, really helpful if they had a real understanding of how the office functions and works and what they can expect. But um, I'm looking forward to seeing the capacity of this growing. I think it would also be great if there could be more, I guess, events in the district, the same way the prior to the pandemic, there was the, um, the mayor's office to combat domestic violence would do these types of forums and seminars. I think it would be really important to do some like, in a positive light, like the mayor's office to end gun violence, but perhaps under a different banner in a sense to say like, here's a fun event for youth and teens. Here's so you, how you can get a job. Here's how you can get career training. We're gonna have a concert. We're gonna have this, there's gonna be food, there's gonna be prizes, there's gonna be how you can sign up for football, basketball tryouts here with this program. Like really something that makes connecting young people to opportunities um, a fun thing to do because at the end of the day, I mean, and I always say this, a lot of gun violence is because we tell our young people to say no to guns, gangs, drugs, uh, unprotected sex, all of these different things. We're telling them to say no to these things, but we're not providing for them what to say yes to. And so it's critical that we have um, events, opportunities, experiences for them to say yes to. Like, I really want the children and the young people of New York to be flooded with opportunities and things for them to do that allow them to harness their passion. So I join the chorus with all of my colleagues. I, I thank you all for your testimony. And I thank you all for the work that you are doing and for building out um, the vision for this office and for it to continue to grow because we shouldn't see this office and, and its growth in comparison to the level of shootings in our community. We should see it more as a preventative measure and there should always be preventative measures that are steeped in connecting our young people to opportunity. And I think that that should always be the work of this office at its center is to connect young people to activities and opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Um, you know, to respond to, you know, some of the key points that you made, you know, majority leader, we have worked with DCLA in terms of actually having an artist in residence and also through our cleanup courts where it's called the Love Where You Live grant, where we actually pair the ability to have um, art-based interventions uh, with organizations that work with young people to ensure that the beautification of their neighborhood has language and constant messaging around peace. So that's something that we definitely want to continue to further through our work, uh, not only with DCLA, but other agency partners. And in addition to actually having visibility and events in community, we've done over 150 public safety events throughout the city. And we hope that with the continued investment in our internal infrastructure, we'll be able to increase that and also increase our ability to enhance our community storytelling initiatives. Thank you so much. Uh, let, let me just uh, accentuate uh, the need for the next council members. You know, all of us at the council, we, we kind of organically um, went through the process with you, right? With the, uh, with the Cure Violence programs. Uh, but this new uh, batch of council members, 36 of them, uh, as I recall, uh, some of them are clueless as to uh, how, how it works. So uh, one of the things that it might be, it will help uh, maybe sometime in December uh, for invite to invite them in and to give you know even if it's a one hour uh, you know basically how how the programs work 
who has what programs, what district, and so forth, the data, uh, the efficacy of them, and also how they could be supportive uh, and, and to talk about the future as well. So, so with that, let me turn it to council member Diaz, which I think is gonna be our last uh, council member asking a question and then, um, then we'll, we'll go to the public. Starting Thank you for, for my last question. It's, it's back to, to Ma. Jay, I wanna make sure, and when you were saying the acronym, you said DHS, I know it's the Department of Homeless Services, but we also know DHS is also known for Department of Homeland Security and I don't want to scare anybody off. No, we were talking about when they homeless. Hate DHS. Yeah, homeless services. Right. We, we don't work with okay. homeless security in any capacity. Okay, I, I just put it out there. You know, just we, no, we don't I want to scare anybody where they may be in need. Giving us the opportunity to clarify. I appreciate that. Good catch. I appreciate you all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Council Member Diaz. That was it so only good. means I paid attention. <laughs> yes, indeed. And you're here. That says a lot. That says a lot. You always care. Thank you. He's, he's so in touch with the community. Uh, so with that, let me turn it over to Committee Council. And I want to thank uh, Mike J team for being here. Again, I, I, I have the highest admiration for the work that you guys have done from the very beginning. And you have scaled up a program that is to be covered uh, nationwide. Uh, and, and you have truly modeled how it works. Uh, sometimes people ask me, well, if the crime is so bad right now, how do we know they're so effective? You know, you're, you're not the police department. If the police department does what they do, and my J team and all the programs do what they do. I think sometimes people mix uh, the, the two things and then there's what we elected officials do and don't do. Uh, they contribute and plus everything that is going on in society. But I have to tell you, 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 you have really come through and uh, you just, truly deserve uh, the trophy of admiration. Thank you so much. Committee Council. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now turn to public testimony. Please be advised that for this portion of the hearing, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you after the panelists has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome Tom Speaker to testify, followed by Ben Weinberg and then Beverly Newsom. Tom Speaker, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the Governmental Operations Committee. My name is Tom Speaker, and I am a policy analyst at reInvent Albany. reInvent Albany is a watchdog organization that advocates for open and accountable government. Uh, today, I'm testifying in regards to introduction number 34 of 2018. reInvent Albany strongly opposes this legislation because we believe it would unfairly benefit incumbents during elections. While we understand that elected officials may want more opportunities to notify constituents of important information, allowing for mailers so close to an election increases the chance that funding for constituent outreach will be used to improperly influence voters. We note that the current law restricts New York City incumbents from mailing their constituents for only six of the 48 months officials are in office unless they run for other offices. New York City prohibits sending mailers within 90 days of an election, but the New York State Legislature's limit under the Assembly's rules and the Senate's guidelines is typically 30 days, though the State Assembly's limit for general elections is 60 days. Some localities have no limit. Because of these lax restrictions, there are countless instances of New York State elected officials deluging their constituents with mailers close to elections. This month, for example, Nassau County Executive Laura Curran sent out a mailer notifying constituents 
about the upcoming November 2nd election when Curran's name will be on the ballot. The mailers noted Curran's name and title. Earlier this year in May, State Senator Kevin Parker flooded constituents with mailers prior to the June election in which he was a candidate for New York City Comptroller. Last year in March, constituents reported that former state legislators David Buckwald and David Carlucci were sending out large numbers of mailers prior to the June primary election for NY17. It's clear that constituent mailers have been exploited prior to elections, and it's likely that this practice will only grow worse if this bill passes. Some might argue that elected officials need more opportunities to contact constituents, but the law already provides plenty of exceptions. For example, officials may send mailers when there are public safety or health emergencies or within 21 days of the passage of the city's budget. We therefore see no reason to change the law. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. I welcome any questions you may have. Tom, um, one really uh, quick question. I noticed that, and thank you for your testimony, and I, I hear your concern, but what I didn't hear, and maybe you could address, what happens when you have a city official running, or vice versa, assembly or senate, or running against a city official? And, and it puts the city official in a great disadvantage. I experienced that myself and one of the races I had. And so uh, for the very same reasons that you just mentioned, uh, that, that they're able to send these mailers, you think it would make more sense for the state to come down with a top-down rule for the entire state, for every single county, uh, whether city or state? Yeah, our view is that the state's law is too lax, and we think that the best approach, instead of weakening the city's law, in our view, would be to strengthen the state law instead. But as it stands right now, do, do, would you agree that it puts the city elected official at disadvantage to the state for, for the reasons that you mentioned? Um, well, I hope that the only reason the city official would send out a mailer would be to help their constituents, of course. But, um, you know, I, I suppose if the mailers were being used for um, other purposes, in that sense, it could be a disadvantage. But I think that candidates for office already have other resources they can use if they want to send out more mailers, such as using their campaign funds. Um, and as I said before, I think the best approach would be to strengthen the state law. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Tom, for uh, your testimony. Uh, if we have any other questions for the council members, uh, committee council? I don't see any hands raised, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd now like to welcome Ben Weinberg to testify, followed by Beverly Newsom and then Michelle Barnes. Ben Weinberg, you may begin your testimony. Thank Time. you. Good morning, Chair Cabrera and distinguished council members. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Ben Weinberg and I am the Director of Policy at Citizens Union. We would like to state our opposition to intro 34 2018 regarding the mailer blackout period. A more detailed memo of opposition has been sent to the council. It was noted that the disparity between city and state rules gives an advantage to state lawmakers over their opponents who serve as city officials. And therefore, the city's blackout period should be shortened. We believe that our argument is inaccurate and misguided. So first, that discrepancy does not necessarily lead to electoral advantage. Let's look at recent examples. In this primary in June, nine state legislators ran for city offices, but only two of those won. All other seven who lost to council member, all other seven, sorry, lost to council members who were under that stricter, stricter blackout rule. In 2017, the last uh, municipal election, the two legislators who ran for city council against city officials who were under that 90 day restriction lost their races. So that supposed advantage uh, is not necessarily a decisive factor in, in kind of campaigning against city officials. Second, our city's robust system of good government rules should be applauded and not relaxed. Relax. So the city is a leader in campaign finance, in ethics, in lobbying regulations. 
And elected officials here are more restricted than elected officials in other jurisdictions. Um, but the point of those restrictions and those regulations is not the advantage or disadvantage of our local elected officials, but to create a more healthy democracy, which these regulations actually do. Uh, third, the real effect of cutting back on mass mailing blackout period would not be in helping council members who are running against state legislators, but in hurting new candidates who are trying to enter the political arena. Uh, New York City has taken important steps to level the playing field in campaigns, to encourage newcomers to run, to ensure that incumbents do not have unfair advantage over challengers. We have the most generous public campaign finance system in the state, in the nation, and the result has been a more diverse field of candidates and uh, fair elections. Weakening the prohibition on the use of government resources for mass mailing would be a step in the opposite direction. Uh, rather than weakening the city's regulations and regressing into the 1998 version, which is that original 30 days version, uh, over 30 years ago now, no, 20, 20 something years ago, uh, we should be looking to strengthen this regulation at the state level, as some have mentioned before. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ben. Any questions, committee council, for members? No hands are raised, Chair. Okay, thank you so much. I'd now like to welcome Beverly Newsom to testify, followed by Michelle Barnes and then Jed Marcus. Beverly Newsom, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Good morning. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Good morning. My name is Beverly Newsom. I'm the president of Evansfield Tenant Organization. The Office to Prevent Gun Violence should be part of the charter because we need to always have an agency that does more than react to shootings and deaths resulting from shootings. Currently, when a shooting occurs in our community, we see candles, caution tape, and police cars. In some communities, this only closes windows and quiets voices, setting the stage for another occurrence. Being a part of the charter expounds the importance of gun education and support to communities experiencing this type of violence. In my view, support should be a mixture of former police officers who are now trained as mental health professionals mixed with civilian mental health professionals. The credible messengers should be individuals professionally trained to communicate effectively and to defend themselves, but sometimes that may be necessary. All not-for-profit staff should resemble the community they're supporting, therefore very diverse. Funding needs to not be influenced by changing politics. Communities should be the driver of the proposed actions, policies, and the focus of the organization. A community advisory board should be cre created to support the not-for-profit in all things. The size of the credible messenger staff should at least match community affairs, including NCO officers of NYPD. These credible messengers, this credible messengers team should be funded to expand by the same percentage of gun involved crimes. Credible messengers should not just show up because of a crime, but will be doing outreach in the community continuously. Recently, Ebbetsfield experienced a shooting which resulted in NYB, NYPD cars on the patio, caution tape, and signs asking residents to turn in individuals with illegal guns for $1,000. No communication to the community, nor was there community engagement. Some residents expressed discomfort with both the shooting and the level of policing. We do need change. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Michelle Barnes to testify, followed by Jed Marcus and then Anna Miranda. Michelle Barnes, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Yes, good morning. My name is Michelle Barnes Anderson, and I lost my only child for gun violence. And I believe that the mayor's office of gun violence should actually stay standing as a permanent agency because 
Your family is not the only person that you need or the only people that can help you get through this. You also need organizations that can help you get through the red tape and the bureaucracy. I mean, I lost my son and I lost my mind. But yet, when I was trying to get through some things to try to find out how can I get his property, it was the mayor's office of gun violence to prevent gun violence to help me get through that. When I try to start a, a resource at the juvenile detention center, it was the mayor's office of gun violence that helped me get through the red tape to actually start this program that's in the progress that's going on right now. I'm trying to help prevent other children from getting murdered, and I'm sitting in the middle of this crime right here in the zip code that you do not consider as one of one of the high affected one one zip code one one two oh one but yet my son was murdered yet it was three other kids that was murdered and because we don't fit in the high zip code we're not having campaigns or ad in our area but our kids are still being murdered it's the mayor's office of preventing gun violence that's helping us with the getting through bureaucracy to get some of the things as as the majority leader said she cannot be our sounding board for every single person. I have used her also to try to help, but she has a whole community, a whole district on all sides that she has to help. And this organization, they can come in and they give a call with the mayor's office of gun to prevent gun violence and people respond, people answer. Mothers like me are sitting right here and can't get through a lot of different things. And that also plays a big part on our mental health. I lost my mind and was have been committed. I have abused alcohol and prescriptive drug trying to get through the pain. But I had resources that can help me through the mayor's office of gun violence to get through red tape. Because when you're trying to get through things and you can't, that puts a big effect on your mental space. Although I may have insurance, some mothers don't have insurance. Some mothers don't have people that they can contact. But if you have an organization that's the uh, agency that's there and the prominent that can help mothers like me get through this, you'll prevent not only mental health, but we'll also be preventing um, gun violence. And we're not just, my child is already gone, but I'm trying to save other children. And the mayor's office can help to prevent from both sides of the barrel, from the front of the barrel and behind the barrel. So I think this is something that should be standing agency. It shouldn't matter because we have a high statistic in one area because what if the statistics go low that means that the gun violence is going to stop so we don't need the office anymore no the office needs to stand to make sure those numbers stay low thank you thank you i'd now like to welcome jed marcus to testify followed by anna miranda and then ed brown jed marcus you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement starting time Uh, Jed, we can't hear you. Jed, you may need to accept the request to unmute. God, I'm with you. I'm sorry. I, I'm better. Yes, perfect. Yes, I'm with you. Uh, coming to you from one community, which is an organization in Fort Greene and Clinton Hill. And uh, our focus is, is equity in our community. Our community has, has great resources and simultaneously many of the people in our community, mostly in our large public housing projects de developments are um, separated from those, those resources by many psychological, social and um, economic barriers. And so uh, we work closely with the council member to make sure that resources are generally available. So I would like to say that number one, we support the bill. Number two, I think it's important that the bill state and the general recognition be that, that community violence is a public health issue and not a criminal justice issue. And it's a criminal a public health issue that requires the integrated response of the many agencies that the majority leader uh, mentioned. And that has to be integral to the to the operation, not only of the office, but on the on the ground day-to-day -day support for people in the community, that there has to be a vehicle on the ground, which enables all the agencies that we mentioned, mental health, family services, education, criminal justice, and social work to, to respond to the specific needs of individuals in our community who are at risk. 
The uh, final thing I'd like to say is that many of the people who are engaged in violence are locked in situations that give them very few alternatives. And again, I'm repeating some of the things the majority leader said. Um, many of us, many of the people who are on this call have a wide range of alternatives. Their lives offer them many vocational, educational, recreational, spiritual alternatives. Whereas many of the people who are, who are involved in gun violence and at risk within our community have very few alternatives at a time when they are making major life choices. The people who are the most at risk are making choices about their peers, about their schools, about, about uh, role models, about um, th their futures, uh, about, uh, and they're modeling new things. They're changing their clothes every day. They're changing their hair every day. And so these are, these are young people who need outlets that are not currently available to them. And so in addition to looking at violence that's occurred, it's very important that we look at prevention by offering people a wide range of resources. And so I would suggest that an important function for the office is working with organizations that marshal resources within our communities. Thank you, Chairman Cabrera, and thank you the other members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Let me uh, acknowledge, first of all, our committee council will be joined by council member Rodriguez. Thanks, Chair. I'd now like to welcome Anna Miranda to testify, followed by Ed Brown. Anna Miranda, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we Hello? can. Hello? Oh, yes, hi. Perfect. Hi, uh, well, yes, yeah, so I agree that we should have the all 50 cent. I also experienced losing a loved one to gun violence, my child's father. And at that time, I had no resources. I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what to do. And I had to kind of figure it out with my family on our own. So having the office there allows people like myself the opportunity to walk in and get the necessary attention that we need, the immediate attention that we need, instead of trying to figure it out on our own, instead of calling on the phone and no one's picking up, we can walk directly into these offices as well as other organizations who are in these, in our communities doing the footwork you know, should also be able to say, listen, this is what's going on with this individual. You know, I only have this to offer. What do you have to offer? And kind of connect us. And everyone's working hand on hand together um, as a community. Everyone at this time should be working hand on hand. We need as much help as we can get. Our communities are in trouble and we are lacking resources. And if we can get organizations to come in and get the help that they need to help other families, if they can't provide the resources themselves because of the lack of funds, then that's what it means. And if that's what it takes, then that's what we need to do. Um, I, I, I just feel like we need the office and it needs to say that. And, and like, you know, Michelle said, whether the rates go low and we feel like it's under control, we need to make sure that it stay low. Thank you, Ms. Miranda. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Ed Brown to testify. Ed Brown, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just gonna be brief. Uh, my name is Ed Brown, as you heard. I'm the former tenant president at the Ingersoll Houses um, in downtown Brooklyn. And um, I experienced, you know, um, gun violence myself as a youth growing up. And then also um, when I was tenant president, um, my uh, oldest son was shot six times. And I support this office because I know that um, if at the time we had an office such as this, you know, I would have had, you know, the office I needed to to reach out his mother as well. You know, we went through a lot. I'm still, I'm still suffering from the mental damage. Of course, my son is as well. Thank, thank God he's still alive. But at the time, um, I was fighting hard to um, get the Ingersoll Community Center open and um, to provide resources and, and, and different programming and workshops for the young people in the neighborhood to keep them from, you know, situations like this. Uh, 
an office like this, you know, it's a no brainer. We need this, a direct connection that addresses the issues because um, although gun violence was prevalent, prevalent in our communities for many years, it seems to be on steroids right now. And the more resources and the more connections we can make directly to the top that can send down resources and, and the th things that we need to get our young people and not just our young people, because some of our older men are still, you know, engaging. Um, I think it's a no brainer. I support this 100%, actually 1000%. And we, we need to keep this going no matter who the mayor is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see Majority Leader Combo has her hand raised. Majority Leader. <clears throat> I just want to thank everybody um, for testifying. Uh, many of the individuals that you heard on this call are part of a monthly meeting um, that I began to figure out ways that we as a community could work with our cure pro violence provider, GMAC, uh, and, and other community partners to end violence in our community. Um, but I think that I, what I really want um, to say too, I wanna to thank Michelle Barnes for her courage. Um, there are so many mothers that I meet on an everyday basis that it's only after years of knowing them will you discover that they've lost a child to gun violence. And it's because for many people, this becomes such a dark cloud that they turn inward and they close off that particular painful experience in their life and that loss of a loved one. And then some are able to utilize that experience to champion for others, um, to keep the memory alive in a way and to do many activities, events and programs to keep their life going. And so I really applaud Michelle for being able to do that. Um, but I wanna address also that um, what Beverly talked about and that's that these shootings still occur. And as she just described that image of a police tape, um, the caution signs and those things that are up, that's really traumatizing elements to see in your community, in your building, to know that someone was shot and or killed in your neighborhood. And, all, and the only explanation that you know is that there's police tape, potentially a day after or two, there's a candlelight vigil, there, there are candles, there are liquor bottles, there are all these sorts of things and flowers that are laid down um, for the person. You know, we've become desensitized to the fact that that is a normal part of our lives in black and brown communities. And that absolutely should not be the case. So my goal is, you know, for this office to really be that on the ground so that people understand, you know, obviously we want to prevent, but in that period and space where we're addressing these issues, that community in Ebbets Field, not even just because of the incident she described, just decades of caution tape need that level of support within that development and, and many other communities to address the, the issues, the the trauma, the, the terrorization um, of losing a child. And for me as a mom of a four-year-old, when I just think about now that I'm a mother, all that goes into bringing a life and, and bringing a life into adulthood, it's, it's unfathomable that somebody could take that away from somebody else. And that level of trauma is so deep that it can't be a thing that's kind of glossed over. It can't be a pamphlet. It can't be, it's got to be real deep therapeutic, psychological help that'll never make that person right again, but to help them to be able to manage and to turn that pain into something that can become livable or productive for them to help others. So I just, I just hope that while we're codifying, God willing, this office into law, that it's also expanded to provide more because caution tape on your way to school and, and, and candles burning should not be the reality that our children or anyone becomes so desensitized to that it just becomes a way of life. So thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Divine Pryor to testify. Divine Pryor, you may begin on the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Divine Pryor and I am the president and chief executive officer of the People's Police Academy located at Meg Evans College in the City University of New York. I first want to uh, say kudos to the majority leader, Lori Cumbo, because I think that uh, she spoke volumes in laying out all of the different dimensions to the trauma that individuals, their families and communities experience as a result of gun violence. And the fact of the matter is, is that for far too long, we've only dealt with the symptoms and we have not dealt with the causal factors. I think that the Office to Prevent Gun Violence should be a permanent office. I think it should be signed into legislation. I think that it should have been long ago. And I think that when it is, and I believe that uh, this attempt to do so will be successful, that when the Office to Prevent Gun Violence actually is a part of the legislative mandate, that we will actually have a, a foundation to build on. But one of the things that we need to be aware of is that the Office of Gun Violence has done something that most offices that are similar to it around the country have not done. What has it done? It has, first of all, raised awareness about the whole issue of gun violence and really promoted the idea of a public health approach to violence as opposed to a law enforcement approach. For years and years, we've only used law enforcement as the heavy arm to address violence, not realizing that the violence that we see across the country is really symptomatic of a lot of deeper issues in communities that historically have not been addressed. Issues around poverty, issues around concentrated housing, uh, issues around poor quality health care, issues around inability to properly educate our children have all contributed to the environment. High rates of unemployment, mass incarceration, all of these things have contributed to the conditions which we now see as violence manifested in so many different ways. The other thing that it's done is produce policy. The office hit the ground running and began to address policy that made it possible for other agencies who otherwise would not have been in this arena to actually take part in creating an environment where we could be safer and we could be healthier. And that is monumental. So you have the Department of Education and the Department of Health and the New York City Housing Authority and the NYPD and so many other city agencies working collaboratively in cooperation with each other to co-produce public safety. And then the third thing it did is put the community at the forefront. They realized that those who are closest to the problem are also closer to the solution. And so they immediately began to recruit individuals who had some involvement in the system, some involvement in lifestyles that were less than safe and ask them, what is it that we could and should be doing to address- I'm inspired. Thank you so much uh, for the time. There's more, I'll provide the remainder in writing. Thank you so much. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Uh, I believe we've heard from all of the registered witnesses on the call, so at this time, and has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no hands raised, I'll now, I'll now turn it to Chair Cabrera for closing remarks. Thank you so much, Committee Council, for a great job uh, that you performed today. As, as, uh, and also I wanna thank uh, Sebastian Bacci, and also uh, my legislative director, uh, Clark Pena. I wanna thank uh, all of the sponsors of the bills uh, that were mentioned today. Thank you for your leadership. Looking forward, uh, having a greater discussion and so we could get them to the finish line. And I wanna thank all the committee members uh, that are, are still here, uh, like Council Member Yeager and, uh, Council Member Levine, thank you, and all the other council members that par participated. And last, let me thank uh, all of the uh, all of you who testified today. Your input is valuable; uh, is taken into great consideration, uh, and we want to make these bills uh, better uh, because when we make them better, uh, we're able uh, to to have a better city. And, and have a better execution plan. 
So with that, uh, we conclude today's hearing.